I am a survivor of three craniotomies, six angiograms, one ruptured aneurysm, and about 10 trans ischemic attacks. So, woohoo for me, right? <laughs> um, just, you know, to be interactive, this is my first time ever doing this, so thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, so, when you were 28 years old, think back to when you were 28 years old, if you can, what were you doing? Did you just finish your bachelor's degree? Did you just get your job security stabilized? Did you just buy your first house? Did you get married? You're starting a family. What are you doing at 28 years old? Anybody? At 28. Yeah, it all started for me at 28 too. So when I was 28 years old, I had just purchased my house. My son was eight years old. Um, yeah, eight years old. And I was working in corporate America, my, my big girl job, I would say, you know, making, making money, having a family, got the white picket fence, got the house, everything's happy. Andrew's playing baseball, every baseball practice, every baseball game, cupcakes, orange slices, you want to name it, it was done. Um, I started to get sick uh, around January. I had a really bad headache and I left work in an ambulance went to the emergency room they did a scan everything was fine oh it's just migraines you have a history of migraines no big deal okay march it happened again except this time my husband at the time picked me up from work took me to the er oh it's just migraines no big deal go home okay june again same thing except that time i didn't go to the hospital i'm gonna go to the hospital there's nothing they're doing for me it's just migraines right mm -hmm. And, you know, intermittently, I'm going to see my physician for injections of migraine medication because my head hurts, right? I start to have trouble concentrating. Some days I can't hold down water. Some days I'm lucid and other days I'm not. I'm missing constant work. Come September 2009, yeah, 2009, I turned 29. Yay! So I made it out of 28. Um, it was worse, pain every single day, lower back, every time I would try to stand up, massive neck pain, head pain, you just, uh, so hard to describe, but there. And every day I had to go to work, and every day I had to take my classes, I was in college at the time too, and every day I had to make sure he got dinner, um, or you know, got on the school bus, things like that, life didn't stop, I had to live through it. So finally in November, yeah, November, I went to Duke Neurology, which my PA had referred me to, my primary care had referred me to. And they treated me like a regular neurologi neurological patient, I guess is the best way to say it right now. And, um, you know, here's a diary, three months, tell me what you're eating, tell me what you're drinking, tell me what you're doing, and I'll see you in three months, just rate your pain every single day and give me a smiley face. Okay, dude, my pain's been like 15 for six months. Like, I'm not understanding why I gotta start at A again. What is wrong? So I listen to him, okay, fine. I'll do what you tell me to do. So I go and I have a beer and I have some cheese and I have some fried chicken wings because I know I can't eat that anymore because if I put that on my diary, they're gonna tell me that's why I have pain. <laughs> so I enjoy that meal and I go home and I take all the caffeine away and all the chocolate and all the wine and all of this and all of that. I'm not getting any better. Nothing is happening except more pain. So I called that neurologist and left a message on his machine at two o'clock in the morning one morning and said, I need your help. Something is wrong, it's massive, I don't know what it is, I don't know what to do, and I don't know who to talk to. But this is not working. Because I couldn't sleep anymore. I couldn't sleep anymore, I couldn't function anymore. I was falling asleep as soon as I would get home from work and not waking up until three o'clock in the morning and finding my son in his clothes from that same day in a pot of SpaghettiOs on the oven because that's all he knew to make. That was so hard for me to watch happen. Anyway, so he gets me in and he says, you know what, I think you might have MS based on your symptoms. You know, the numbness, the tingling going on with the headaches and the neck pain and so on. So I wanna get you in and I wanna get a scan of your neck. Excuse me, see if you have MS. I'm also gonna go ahead and do a scan of your head because nobody's really looked at your brain in a while. Okay, let's do it. So the Saturday after Thanksgiving, I was in the MRI machine at Duke Raleigh over there off of Wake Forest Road. And Duke and Caroline were playing that day, and I'm a huge Caroline fan. My dad was at the game, but I was stuck in the MRI machine. But they let me check my phone to check tech scores, you know, as they had to change the coverings for the MRI and things like that. So that was nice. 
So that test took, I believe it took about 45 minutes for everything to be done, the head, the neck, contrast, no contrast, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so Monday, I call my neurologist's office and I say, hey, got some results? The nurse says, yeah, I got the results. Doctor's gonna call you. You, you got the results? Can I have them? <laughs> no, doctor's gonna call you. All right, well, I guess that means I have MS, so I'm gonna Google MS. I'm gonna drive myself to massive higher education about some MS, because that's what that means, because she's not telling me. My doctor and I play phone tag for four days. Thursday, we finally get on the phone. About 4.15 in the afternoon, I'm sitting at my desk. Pain, pain, pain. I am wearing, you know those portable um, heat pad things you can get? I have them on my forehead, on my neck, on my back, and all up here every day, just so I can go to work, okay? Pain beyond belief. So he gets on the phone with me and he goes, hey, so I think we got an answer. So why are you having all these symptoms? Oh, all right, great. What is it? That it's MS, right? It's going to be MS. No, it's a 10 millimeter aneurysm behind your left eye. Okay, no problem. It's an answer. I've got an answer, which means I can find a solution, which means I can get better and I don't have to be in this pain every day anymore. I was so excited to find out that I had a brain aneurysm. You would think I was crazy, literally crazy. So... I go in the next morning for an MRA, which is where they look at just the arteries of your, whatever they're scanning, it was my brain of course. It confirmed the 10 millimeter aneurysm, but I didn't have an appointment that day to find out about that aneurysm. So we're gonna talk about how you advocate for yourself real quick. So I had that scan done, Duke Raleigh, the neurology office is right across the street. Mind you, I waited four days to get the information that I had an aneurysm in my brain, right? So the hospital's here, that's where they do the scan, and then the doctor's office is here. So as soon as the scan was done, I walked over to the doctor's office and said, hey, my scan's done, what's it say? Well, we don't know yet. Okay, well, I'm gonna go get some breakfast, and I'm gonna come back, and then you can tell me what it says. Okay, so I go get breakfast, and I come back. Well, we still don't know. So I walked to the hospital, I got a copy of the scan, and I took it back to the doctor's office. And I said, okay, what does it say? Can you tell me what it says? Well, no, we need time to read it. You know, the radiologist has it. Okay, look, it's Friday. I was just told I have an aneurysm in my brain. I'd really like some results before, you know, end of business today. Is that possible? Yeah, come back at 1.30, we'll talk to you. So 1.30, I walk in the office, and I kid you not, I didn't even get to sit down in the chair. The lady stands up, we've been waiting for you. We've been waiting for you, come on back here. So they take me all the way to the back, to the room on the left, the back, the last room on the left. And I'm sitting in that office, and... The neurologist comes in and he's like, yeah, you know, I can't tell you that it is this, you know, that that's what's causing it, but it's very possible and it is the 10 millimeter and you have to have brain surgery. Okay, well, is it, can they operate on it? Well, I don't know yet. The, the brain surgeon's coming in to talk to you. Okay, so a brain surgeon comes to talk to me, not my brain surgeon, but a brain surgeon within that practice, comes in to talk to me, tells me, yeah, we gotta operate, it's gonna be a clip, you have two options. You have several options with an aneurysm, but generally speaking, it's a coil or a clip. Coil is less invasive. Um, does it has about an 83% success rate, whereas a clip, this open brain surgery, has about a 98 to a 99% success rate. So we're gonna do the clip because you're young and you're healthy and it's big enough, so we're gonna cut your brain open. All right, that's what we're gonna do. It's gonna fix it, I'm not gonna hurt anymore, right? Nope, you're not gonna hurt anymore. So my neurosurgeon calls me that afternoon and he says, well, we can get to this after Christmas. Mind you, it is December 4th. I have been in pain to some degree almost every day since January. Now you know what it is. And I had to fight you to get you to tell me what I could do about it. So I had to wait to find out what was wrong, and now you want me to wait even longer to do something about it. And I, I'm talking to the surgeon, I'm walking down the trail by my white picket fence in my house, and I'm like, no, I'm not. I cannot wait. I, I don't want to wait for this time bomb in my brain. He's like, well, you know, it's not likely to rupture, but really, we can wait till, I said, you know what, and here's an insurance kit for you. I said, you know what, as of right now, my insurance pays 90-10. After January 1st, it's gonna pay 80-20. So how much money do you want to make? Oh, we can get you in in the next 10 days. Thank you. So on December 
14, I checked into Duke, Main Duke out in Durham. And I had an angiogram for the first time ever. That was fun. Not really. So they confirmed that it was a 10 millimeter aneurysm. One was, there, it was a snowman. One was on top of the other. So basically an aneurysm had grown and then another aneurysm had grown off of that one and they were connected, okay? Big, bad, ugly stuff, right? He tells me we can still clip it, see you tomorrow morning. No problem. So tomorrow morning, they come December 15th, they hit those lights at like 5.30 in the morning. Um, and they said it's time to go and I was kind of rude and I said no, I need to pull my hair back, wash my face, brush my teeth, go to the bathroom and then it'll be time to go. Well, the doctor's waiting. Well, he can wait 10 minutes. I'll, I, you know, I'm his first case today. He's not going anywhere. So they gave me that. And while the orderly or the employee was waiting outside my door for me to finish getting prepped for surgery, I guess is how you can say it, um, I was sneaking my rosary and pictures of my son and my netbook and my cell phone all under my sheets because my biggest fear was I wasn't going to be able to communicate when I woke up. I wasn't going to be able to talk. That was my fear. I wasn't afraid of dying. I never thought I was going to die, but I, that was my fear. I'm not going to be able to communicate when I get up. So I snuck all that stuff in, and obviously by the time we got to operating, they figured it out and took it all from me, and okay, fine. So they do the surgery. It was six and a half hours, cut my head open. I wake up uh, about 11.30 that night, and I feel my head, and I can feel the wrap around my head, and I can feel my hair is kind of sticky and nasty, and my dad was there, and um, I talked to him for all of 30 seconds and just said, you know, it hurts. And he goes, they're going to give you something. And I said, it's absolutely not going to work because nothing had been working. So I've got this mindset of nobody can help me. This pain is going to continue. Okay. But I can communicate, right? I woke up and I can recognize people and I can communicate. So I'm okay. So they give me the big bad Dilaudid, which I had never had before. That stuff will make you go to sleep and not be in pain. So that's nice. The next morning I wake up and there's nobody there. There's no caregiver there. There's no family there. It's just me and the ICU nurse. And I am, okay, I did what I'm supposed to do. I survived the surgery. I, I cannot lay here anymore. I gotta get back to my life. I need to get back to my son. I need to get back to my job. I need to get, you know, my life has been in shambles since all this started. I did what I'm supposed to do. I survived, let me go, I wanna walk. Ooh, I wanna walk. Okay, so I get to walk. So they let me walk the hallway. After I took that walk, I couldn't move. My head hurt so bad all over again. I just laid there like a lump for about three days. They thought I had a brain fluid leak. So they went in and did a blood patch where they inject you twice in your spine and it hurts, but you get to be awake for it, so that's nice. Mm -hmm. um, and the doctors were talking about the Christmas party they were gonna go to. Like I remember them talking about the Christmas party and how much fun they were gonna have while I'm on this table in massive pain trying to figure out why I'm not better because I did what I was supposed to do. So they assume that the blood patches work and they send me home, I think it was the next day. I was home within 72 hours of that open brain surgery, okay? When they sent me home, I begged not to go home. Please don't, please don't let them send me home. Something is wrong. I'm not walking much. I'm not talking a whole lot. I'm not eating. I'm not interacting. Something's wrong. I'm in a lot of pain. Please don't let them send me home. Not one of my caregivers listened because they were listening to the doctors because they didn't have any experience with us. They didn't know what to do. The doctors are saying you can go home. The doctors are saying you're going to heal. The doctors are saying you're supposed to be this way. So it's time to go home. So I literally have my head laying down on a pillow like this in a wheelchair after they have ripped the IVs off of me and put me in a sedative state to get me in the car so I will go home. But I am begging not to go home. There is something wrong. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So I get home. I stay home for 22 hours. During that 22 hours, I had 102 fever. Um, I was not eating. I think I drank one or two of those vanilla insures. Um, I wasn't getting up. I wasn't walking. None of those things. So finally, a uh, Duke Life Flight nurse, who happened to be a friend of ours, a neighbor of ours, she had come over to watch me so that my husband at the time could run to the drugstore because he had already sent his mom home saying everything was okay. Everything was fine. My wife, the person I know forever and the most, is not okay, but the doctors are telling me she's okay, so she has to be okay. 
So my friend comes over and she forces me up to walk and when she does that projectile bomb, it starts and my eyes go like this. And she tells my husband when he gets back, she's gotta go back to the hospital, she's gotta go right now. She's gotta go 911, she can go in your truck, I don't care, she's gotta go, okay. So they take me, well, he takes me. Her husband happened to be an RN at Duke Emergency and he was on staff that day. So the call had come in ahead to him on his personal cell phone that I was coming. So when we got there, I literally had a personal stretcher and a personal nurse pull me out of that truck. I was in the last 45 minutes of my life. My brain was bleeding. When they did this, the CT scan, my aneurysm had ruptured. I had um, an 8.5 millimeter shift from center line of my brain, which is why my eyes were like that, which is why I didn't know my name, which is why I couldn't communicate, which is why I was just staring at everybody like, who are you? Like, hey, what's your name? Like, I don't know anybody. So they rushed me in for another craniotomy. Woohoo, I did that. Made it through that. I woke up from that craniotomy. I couldn't communicate. I couldn't talk. I couldn't talk at all. I didn't know everybody. I knew that they were supposed to be there, but I didn't really know who they were, if that makes sense. Um, I could hear the doctors asking questions. One of the questions was, what is your, do you have a child? And I'd shake my head, yes. What's your child's name? I had no idea. I couldn't find it. I knew I was supposed to know, but it was just, I couldn't find it. You ever get stuck on a word like, oh, what's that thing called? What's that thing called? And you're stuck. That's exactly what it was like for my own son's name. So I was in what they call vasospasm. So basically your arteries are supposed to be open wide like this. So the blood can go from your brain to your heart, right? That's what supplies the blood and the oxygen so your brain can operate properly. Mine was closed to like this. So I wasn't getting enough blood and oxygen to my brain for it to function properly. So they gave me a bunch of um, blood pressure medication to lift that blood pressure to see if, if they got it going faster, it would function properly. When they did that, it, there was some success. I was able to speak. I wasn't all the way there, but I still was able to speak. So there was some, some progress there. So they decided when my organs started to show that they didn't like that medication to take me off of that medication. And I had two options. I could do a bypass. These now be up to my caregivers to decide this because I'm in no way able to decide. So I could do a bypass. So they would go in my brain again and do a bypass of my arteries to get away from the, the spasming part. Or there was a 20, and that was very invasive. And if I bled out, I would have had three minutes to live and it would have been done. It would have been, you're gone. Or I could do a verapamil ball into my artery through angiogram. There was a 20% chance that that would work. So they wheeled me down to the angiogram room. And they put the medicine ball in my brain. It was a wait while they did it. It took 22 minutes. Literally, so 22 hours at home begging to go back to the hospital. In 22 minutes, my artery went from this to this. And they wheeled me out of that room and I recognized all of my family on that wall and I was smiling for the first time, and I was able to listen to what they were telling me and have a short conversation. It was, it was great. And then I went into pulmonary edema, which is where there's a lot of fluid in your lungs and you can't breathe. So you have an oxygen mask over your face and a nurse running back and forth, and they're telling you they're gonna give you Lasix to dry you out, and they're gonna get a CPAP machine in. Luckily, I didn't have to have a breathing tube. Um, so they did all that. They put me down, put me down, they put me to sleep. Uh, pulmonary edema eased up about 3.30 that morning, and that was it. Then it was, there weren't any other massive complications after that, thankfully. So I went home, I'm gonna say four or five days after the pulmonary edema, and I could be wrong on that, you know, I was still spacey. So when I got home, I was in a, a, a state of, sort of euphoria if you'll if you'll bear with me there i wanted to go out i wanted to do things i wanted to party i wanted to buy that dress buy that purse whatever i mean i just survived something i should not have ever survived and so now life is a totally different element to me um so i wanted to do all of those things and then it was you know time to go back to work about 12 weeks later and I had started cognitive therapy, you know, the brain problems, the, the, the math problems they give you, or the, the little word games they play with you. So I had done that. Um, I went back to work, my, my corporate gig, my big, my big money gig, right? Managing 
the multi-million dollar budget across four departments and being a coordinator for any compliments, complaints that came into the CEO um, or VPs, I had to fish those. I had to make sure they got taken care of. Um, also helped with software integrating programs and things like that. But anyway, lots and lots of multitasking, lots and lots of managing for projects. And when I got back to work, oh, I can't do that anymore. What am I going to do now? I can't do that anymore. I don't know how to do that anymore. I don't know how to multitask. And Bob just told me he needs 16 things. And I might remember one of the things he said. This isn't good. So I went for my review, my employee review. Was due, I think it was three weeks after I got back. Mind you, it was only part time when I first went back. Um, and they basically told me, we need you to step up. We need you to do more. You know, you need to be my shadow. You need to know everything I know. And you need to be more into these projects. And, oh, well, I can't very well do that right now. There's no way I can put that smile on and make that happen. So I left work. Um, short-term disability again, went back to cognitive therapy, went to neuropsych therapy, went to all these therapies. You know, somebody please make me better. Let me get back to what I was. I know I can do it. No, you can't. No, you can't. There is life before a ruptured aneurysm and there is life after and they are two very different things. They're not bad. Neither one of them is bad. They're just different. So you get to, ooh, sorry. You get to live through the depression that comes with that. And that affects everybody around you, your caregivers, your family, everybody. I mean, my son watched me pretty much lay in bed for almost a year trying to figure out why did this happen to me? Why is my life so different? Why did I have to lose everything I worked for? Yeah, that why question is a pain in the butt. Can I tell you? And when you get stuck in that why question, why did this happen to me? Oh man, you're never gonna get out of that bed. You're just not, it's a black cloud and it just hangs on you. I, sh I try to call it, you know, little trolls or little imps that are at your back telling you, oh, well, you're not as good as you used to be. Oh, well, you can't do what you used to do. So really what good are you? No, shut up. I can't hear you anymore. I have to figure out how I'm gonna make this my best life and not compare it to the best life I had before. So I started to go to school. I took a small math class at Wake Tech, the local community college. That gave me a reason to get out of bed three times a week in the morning. Gave me a purpose. I got to sit and focus and listen. And I hate math, by the way. Can't, cannot. I hate, I've hated it since middle school. <laughs> so I take this math class. Guess what? I pass it. I pass it with a big fat A. I was like, oh. I can do that. I can do that. You know what that means? That means I can go to work part-time doing something different. So I did that. I worked for about a year. Then I went part-time somewhere else. That worked for two years. Then I came all the way out just because I couldn't function as, as a mom and as a wife and as a bill payer and as a cook and as a taxi driver and all of those things and still work. So I came out of work all the way. Um, you know, surviving is hard, um, and it's not just hard for that first year or the first two years as you start to, you know, figure out who you are. It's hard for several years, um, and everybody heals at their own pace. So I thought, I'm all healed. I'm ready to go. Life is good, right? I, I build this new life. Everything's good. It's good. I got bubbles in my head. That's what I call them. As soon as I got to the acceptance level and the the anger and the fear were gone. Not, they're just called bubbles, whatever. I messed up my words, it's bubbles, no problem. All right, so everything's pretty good. Life's going great, right? Medical alert, code stroke, emergency department, B13, ETA, five minutes. Medical alert, code stroke, emergency department, B13, ETA, five minutes. Um, so life's good. I rebuild a life. Uh, you know, obviously I'm not working, but I do a lot of other things. I volunteer for some companies and help them with some things that they've got that I still have the capacity to understand. Um, I spend a lot of time at home. 
I have two wonderful dogs. My son used to spend a lot of time with me at home too, but then, you know, he turned 16, 17, 18, 19. He's got better things to do. Totally understand. Makes sense. Um, but November this year, when they did my annual scan, I get scanned every year since I had my aneurysm, my blown up aneurysm. Um, they found an aneurysm in my brain that we knew about six years ago, but it hadn't been growing. So we just left alone while it started to grow again. Ooh, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? Nope. So Duke didn't, Duke took the approach of we wanna wait, we're gonna scan you every three months and see if it grows any bigger because it's not very big right now. And for somebody who doesn't have a bleed history, that could probably work. Statistically, I mean, there's less than a 1% chance that it's gonna rupture, but I know what a ruptured brain aneurysm does. Now, I don't wanna do that again. I, really, I don't think I can do that again. So I went to Mayo Clinic. I sent my stuff to Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And 14 weeks ago, they clipped another aneurysm in my brain. So 14 weeks ago, I had open brain surgery on an unruptured aneurysm. And I'm standing here and I'm talking to you and I'm joking and I'm living my life again because it didn't rupture, because it got to it in time, because mm -hmm. somebody listened. Somebody said, hey, this lady's got a situation and let me see if I can help her. And they did. I didn't have to wait eight months for the medical field to figure out, she really needs some help. Oh, well, she's not kidding. These aren't migraines. So it's really, really important as a patient and as a caregiver for you to advocate for yourself. If your patient can't advocate for themselves, advocate for them as loud as you possibly can. I, I advocated today. I, I had a TIA Thursday. I was at Duke Thursday. Stayed Thursday night. Was released Friday. All of that stuff has been sent over to Mayo. Please take a look because Duke says there's nothing they can do. There's nothing they can do for this part of my medical history. Can you? And I haven't heard anything. So I called today. Hey, how's it going? How are you doing today? What'd you have for lunch? Have you had a chance to look at that stuff yet? Well, not yet, but tomorrow we will because we'll be in clinic. Okay, great. Thanks for that answer. Have a good day. But it's really, really important that you push those doors down and you stomp your feet, especially when it comes to your medical care. But don't cry wolf because if you cry wolf, then you, you might get yourself in some trouble. But as far as caregiving goes, in relation to my situation and my journey, my first caregiver, he didn't have a whole lot of knowledge as to what to do. Um, and that was one of the things he said. I called him and asked him to give me some insight about what he would have liked to have seen happen if he could have changed anything. One of the things he said is he would like to see a nurse go home with the brain injury patient for the first 36, 72 hours that they're home to teach that caregiver what they need to do and what to expect from a, you know, a medical patient point of view, um, which I don't think is a bad thing, but I don't know many insurance companies that are gonna pay for that. Um, communication is key, key with your caregiver. Your daughter may have, and I hope you don't mind me using mm -hmm. this. That's okay. Your daughter, and I don't know a whole lot about her brain injury, but in, in my situation, I can see a hundred mistakes that I make every day, a hundred things that are different than what they were before I had this, this situation happen to me. And my caregiver may see one thing and make a joke about it because they think it's okay, right? It's comfortable. Oh, I'm gonna joke about it, make them laugh, they're gonna feel fine. And your daughter may go total ape crazy on you because you said one thing about that one instance, mm -hmm. but she's seen a hundred of them. She's living in her head over and over, why can't I do this the way that I used to? Why is this this way? How do I figure out who I'm supposed to be and how I fit into this world now? So try not to take instances like that personally because it's just us being frustrated. It's just us trying to figure out how to explain to a world of people that can't understand. And that's not to put anybody down on the caregiver side you cannot, as a caregiver, understand 150% what we are going through. And we will try to explain it to you as much as possible. We will put adjectives and verbs and nouns and songs. I tell my, my boyfriend now, who went through the, the clipping with me 14 weeks ago, well, there's this song, and not the words, but the way that they sing it, that's what I feel like in my head sometimes. Or, oh, there's this picture. You look at this picture, that's what I feel like in my head sometimes. I give them visuals. That's the best I know how to do. 
Um, communication's key. I, I can't stress that enough to any caregiver. You've got to talk to each other. You have to understand. And sometimes, just to be on the funny side, you can throw a safe word in. So maybe your patient has a safe word that's like, mm -hmm. leave me alone today, I don't find anything funny. And they say that safe word and you as a caregiver understand, okay, no jokes today. You know what I mean? Or you know what, we're gonna cut that, that 10, 15 minute walk today down to five or seven minutes. Just because you know that your patient's not feeling well and they can tell you that from that one word. Um, what were the other things I wrote? <laughs> So, communication hard. Caregivers. Okay, so caregivers, I, I think it's important as a caregiver from a patient perspective to try to do the small things. I know caregivers get worn out. I know they get frustrated. I know they, they get lost trying to figure out their whys. Dis, you had disbelief up, disbelief up here earlier. I think a caregiver's disbelief is our why. So the caregiver gets stuck in disbelief, and we get stuck in why, we ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. We're not making any strides to any progress. So, um, so I think it's important that caregivers not only be the laborer of our disability, but also the one who maybe makes the coffee in the morning, the one who sits next to us while we do the crossword puzzles or we do our cognitive therapy homework. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to say a word, just be there. Do your own crossword puzzle while I do my crossword puzzle. And you know what, if I get stuck and I want your help, I'm gonna tap on that table and I'm gonna say, hey, help me. But if you're not there, I can't ask for your help. If you're not there, I cannot ask for your help. I need your help, but I may not know how to ask for it. But if you're there, even if you're there in silence, I'm eventually gonna reach out and touch your hand and say, hey, can I get some more? So, it's important for that. I also think it's important that as caregivers, you understand that everybody heals at their own pace. There's no timeline once we go through something like this. It took me three years to turn myself around, sort of. I didn't get all the way around, but it took three years for me to understand, you know what, it's okay. It's okay that I have bubbles and it's okay that I went through this. And it took me nine and a half years to be able to share my story with people like I am now. So time, it's going to take lots and lots of time and lots of patience, but you'll find a balance and you'll find a common ground. You just both have to work together to get there. And caregivers, when you get frustrated, it's okay. Go get a massage, go buy yourself a Starbucks, go to the park, read a book, go play cards with your friends. I don't care what you want to do. Get away from your patient, get away from them. Have somebody you trust that you can call on to say, hey, Molly Sue, can you come sit with Anne because I just need, I need like 30 minutes. Can I get 30 minutes? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Nothing, nothing. And if your patient looks at you and says, how dare you leave me? You look at your patient and you go, I'll be back. Mm -hmm. And you keep right on going, okay? So that's, you know, most of my journey. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you found something useful in it. And uh, again, thank you.